and on the phone, and not only on the phone, but also on um, VMix, where I'm getting a terrible, terrible feedback. So, are you getting it, Mayor? Can I'm you hear not. the feedback? You're not? Okay. We'll deal with it. How are you? I'm great. How are you this morning, Paul? I'm doing good. I mean, I'm reading some of this and um, trying to figure it all out. And tell Will that we're getting a tremendous feedback here uh, and echo on this thing. Since our last visit, I mean, I think you've done made some tough choices there. And I know it wasn't easy. I am losing you, Paul. I can't hear you very well now. Okay. You can't. How about now? Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you great. Okay. Let's talk, let's talk about the furlough. You had to furlough 135 full-time employees, and I know it wasn't easy. But again, furlough means that they are coming back. That's right. That's right. We, we've had to make a lot of tough decisions in the past month. And, you know, we are a community that depends on sales tax dollars for our general operating budget. And uh, more than a third of our general operating budget comes from sales taxes. And we project that between now and the end of the fiscal year, which is September 30th, we will be down at least $2 million in sales tax and another million in court fines, building and permit fees, um, activity fees that we typically would receive if our M-Trade Park and Oxford Park Commission were up and running on all cylinders. So we're looking at about a $3 million deficit between now and the end of the year. Next year, though, it's, if, if this continues, God forbid, it's going to be uh, even what, well, what? I think you projected over six million. That's right, down more than twenty percent next year if these trends continue. When you look at this and you see a three million dollar shortfall before the end of fiscal year, uh, there, there's, I mean, you can do everything you could possibly do to try to m mitigate that, but cutting the cost is the only way to do it. It really is, Paul. We we have examined it from every angle, and we began by, um, of course, having a hiring freeze and eliminating all travel for employees and training. We also um, canceled any equipment orders that we had made that we could still cancel. We've stopped all projects that weren't already moving along. You know, things that we had budgeted for this year we were able to eliminate. We have um, suspended our curbside recycling program that cost the taxpayers about $500,000 this past year. And, mm. uh, you know, once we had cut everything that we could cut from every department's budget, we realized that we were going to have to furlough employees at some point in time. And it looks like probably, you know, our sales tax revenues come in two months after they're collected. So, you know, looking at fall when those sales tax revenues from this spring summer come in is when we're going to have the hardest time. And we looked at the fact that we need to furlough people for about three months. And yeah. we decided that it was in the best interest of our employees to do that now while they could take advantage of the CARES Act instead of. That was one of the reasons you decided to do it now, not to or not not at the end of the fiscal year, just so they could take advantage of that. Yes, that's why. I mean, it saves the city the same amount of money whether we furlough them now or in September. Mm -hmm. So it just made sense and in the best interest, certainly, of our employees to be able to do that while they could take advantage of the CARES Act. Just got to ask you, how was it going into this? So it's almost like Trump and looking at what the budget was, uh, looking what the income was. You guys were rolling on pretty good in, as far as Oxford's concerned before this happened. Yeah, we, you know, we have been very blessed to have a thriving tourism industry in Oxford that drives our economy and small businesses certainly are the backbone of our community mm -hmm. and our economy. And, you know, when they're closed it, and the students are gone and you don't know when they're coming back or what the fall is going to look like, it's, it is scary times for sure in Oxford. I think people don't realize this, but Oxford's like a lot of college town, and, and when school's not there, you lose about, what, 35%, 40% of your population. We do. We are probably down about 40% in our population right now. We, you know, Oxford, Lafayette County University premier each other in population. Mm -hmm. The city about 25,000, campus about 20,000, and then the county adds another 22,000. So we all kind of mirror each other. 
Have you heard from the school, from the university, what the plans are for this fall? Well, we are keeping in close contact. Um, I don't think they have a solid plan yet, Paul. Uh, you know, it will no. it will depend on um, how this slow rollout goes of trying to reopen the community. Of course, you know, then there are concerns about who, what students are going to come back, what parents will be comfortable sending their students back to live in dorms and um, apartments with other people. I just, you know, there are, there are so many moving parts and Certainly, we've never done this before, so it's, it, it becomes very hard to predict. Yeah. Well, and, and it's, it's, you've, you're making decisions now as far as the summer's concerned. I, I, some of those kids who had a chance to have a, a part-time job. You're cutting out on me, but I think you said we're making plans for the summer. Yeah, some of the, some of the have- ones in the summer. Yeah, and you know, summer school sessions have been canceled. They will be online. Um, we are seeing that there's still some students in town who had, of course, paid for apartments and are choosing to shelter in place here rather than in their mm-hmm. hometowns. So there, there are some students here, but with our small businesses all closed, you know, we aren't having the benefit of that added population right now. City, the city pools are also going to be in. Uh, a casualty of this uh, summer too are they not they are we um you know it would cost us between seventy five thousand and a hundred thousand dollars to make to the pool to open it this year and then mm-hmm. we spend about ninety two thousand dollars a year um, on supplies and lifeguards and those kinds of things so um not knowing even if we invested the money to get the pool open not knowing whether or not we would be in a safe place to be able to allow groups to gather there. We decided that was something that should be suspended this year as well. I think when you start looking at the people who normally come to Oxford on a regular basis, certainly during the sports season, but the square is, this is eerie, is it not? It is. I, you know, driving around the square at night or walking out the front door of City Hall at noon to an empty Mm -hmm. square is just, it is eerie. That's the best way to put it. Um, You know, we are, we, we are always bustling. There used to be slow times of the year in Oxford. It used to be that the summer was a slow time or that, uh, you know, the Christmas holiday was a slow time, but that's not really the way it's been in the past five or 10 years. So um, this, this is a very weird feeling and it's not one that we want to continue. No, I will say this. And I think most people understand this when we do get back to normal or even somewhere near that people are going to appreciate it more than they ever thought they would. Oh, I hope so. You know, I believe that, of course, in a pandemic, in any type of crisis, sometimes it brings out the worst in people. Sometimes it brings out the best in people. But, you know, I do believe that it has made us all more grateful for the things that we take so for granted day in and day out. You know, just time with family and um, things being a little slower paced. And I think that's great. But it's time to pick it back up and um, (laughs) for life to go on, right? Question on the Assis Park task line about your rainy day fund. I think they said you had about thirty million dollars in the rainy day fund, and why haven't the, why isn't that being used? We have. Uh, it's it's not a rainy day fund. It is the proceeds from the sale of Baptist Hospital, and we that was set up by local and private legislation, and so it is very structured in how we can access those funds. We get a three percent draw each year from those funds which tends to be between eight hundred and $900,000. Fi- and approximately 500000 of that is committed to bond payments currently. And we utilize the other three to $400,000 each year for equipment purchases or capital improvements. We um, count on that money, obviously, every year. The way the legislation is written, if we take a larger draw, so if we took 10% of that fine and made up our $3 million deficit, we would not be able to take our 3% draw again until the fund had replenished itself. So with $500,000 of that annual draw being committed to bond payments, we would, it was kind of robbing Peter to pay Got it. There's, it's almost like a trust fund. There are rules and regulations the way you can do the withdrawals. That's right. 55 gallon, uh, you've had 55 gallon barrels of sanitizer. I was reading some we of this. Have, I said, 50, uh, we, you had how many barrels it was? Well, Six we, barrels? 
the city has purchased six barrels. We have donated four barrels or given away four barrels. Cathead Distillery in Jackson <laughs> was so generous to partner with us on that venture, and it's allowing us to supply hand sanitizer to all of our first responders, our guys that are picking up trash with our environmental I got services. I've got it. And, and got to go. The computer's going to take us off. Thank you, ma'am. I appreciate it. And thank you for uh, doing the VBEX for us. I appreciate it. We enjoyed it. Thank you, ma'am. All right.